A retired couple are enjoying a day out in the New Mexico backcountry. You didn't have control of anything. You were rolling. But when a stroke of bad luck leaves them stranded in a hostile environment. There was no human life around. We were it. They're faced with a grueling hike back to civilization. They dropped. But in this unforgiving environment, a simple hike becomes a desperate fight for survival. It was excruciating. She didn't have a lot left in her. I just felt like I had to save her. No way. I'm not leaving you. You're the only one that can get us out of here. Tom and Linda Bosworth are enjoying a carefree retirement. Today, they're looking forward to a day out. You coming, honey? A drive and a picnic in the New Mexico wilderness. Hey, put that down. That's for lunch. Tom and Linda have been married for 32 years. Their lifetime of shared adventures stretches back to the 70s, when they met on a skiing holiday in Aspen. He was really nice. He was not a phony, and he was cute. I thought she was... Very nice looking, number one. I thought she had a fantastic personality. That smile of hers was a knockout. You're not ready in five. I'm going. Vietnam veteran Tom has spent a lifetime working in the car industry and his leisure time racing cars. He's still got the bug. He's just finished rebuilding a second-hand Jeep. Tom refurbished the entire thing. Tom loves a thrill. I've always loved cars, ever since I can remember. I always took things apart. It's the middle of summer, and Tom wants to test his creation off-road, out in the New Mexico backcountry. Linda's going along for the ride. OK, action man, I'm coming. And I remember looking to see if there was any treat in the freezer we might like for dessert, and there wasn't. But I looked at that big water jug we had frozen, and I thought, oh, maybe I should take that. And I thought, oh, no, I've got enough with me. There we go. Oh. Let me give you a hand. Right. Ready? Let's go. Well, it was a beautiful day. I thought it'd be fun to do. I thought Linda and I would really like it. This was to fall in love with the mountains in this vehicle. Glad you came. So am I. Wouldn't have missed it for the world. Tom and Linda make a quick pit stop for petrol en route to the mountains. We were filling up with fuel. I called my sister. Hi, Barb. It's Linda. And told her what we were going to do, and she said, you're crazy. <laughs> Excited. Tom, I mean, what do you think? He's like a teenager again. <laughs> She knew we were going off-road, but she had no idea where we were going. It doesn't occur to Linda to tell her sister exactly where they're going. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Who's that? Sis. Ready? Ready when you are. It was exciting to think this is really our exciting trip. We were thrilled to be able to do it. 
Their destination is a network of rugged trails in the Buro Mountains, in the heart of the vast and remote Gila National Forest. It's out in the mountains. It's beautiful. New Mexico is, really is a land of enchantment. The couple love the great outdoors, and Tom can't wait to see how well the vehicle handles on the dirt tracks of the Saddle Rock Trail. The whole thing was exciting for me, and I kept saying, Linda, how do you like this? It's great. <laughs> Look at that. I was giggling a lot because it was fun. She was smiling and excited. From that, I was excited. After their picnic lunch, Tom and Linda take in the isolated splendor of their surroundings. Pretty special, isn't it? Beautiful. There were trees around. You get a lot of shadows from the sun. It was beautiful, just beautiful place. They've both enjoyed bumping over the backcountry trails. Now Tom's itching to see how his rebuilt Jeep handles even tougher terrain. Now, Linda, come here a minute. Tom had a map. It wasn't a perfect map, but I felt very confident. <laughs> I definitely encouraged him to keep going. OK. Let's really test this baby out. Tom's chosen a route that will take them way off the main trails, into the empty heart of the wilderness. It was exciting. The trees were hitting us. The terrain was, oh my gosh, we were bumping and bumping. Kind of a roller coaster ride. I was piloting the craft like I always do. She had total confidence in me. Oh, oh, that was close. I said to Tom, thank gosh, it's you driving. Oh. Oh. The jeep just rolled. It was scary. What in the world is going on? Are you okay? I'm laying there with my elbow on the ground, looking up at my wife and feeling fear. Are you okay? Tom was anxious that I was okay, but I said quickly, I'm okay. By some miracle, neither of them is badly hurt, but the danger isn't over. First thought that came to my mind is, are we gonna catch on fire? Car expert Tom is worried that a stray spark from the vehicle's electrics might ignite leaking fuel or even trigger an explosion. Quick, we got to get out of here. I wanted to get us both out. Linda is badly shaken and entangled in her seatbelt. I'll go first, and then I'll pull you out, OK? OK. But Tom must get free before he can pull her out. I began putting my feet on the dash of the seat, the steering column, and then I got out. Get me out. Okay, honey. I was anxious to get out of that vehicle. Get out of my arm. I'll pull you out. Stay on the side. Don't let go of me. Don't let go. No, no, no. I got you. Got it? Uh-uh. Yeah. Yeah. Got it? Yeah. Yeah. 
your clothes. I got you. Fall into her. Okay, Chris, get out of here. That was very scary. Tom and Linda have had a lucky escape. Kilometers from anywhere. The Jeep is their only way out of this fix. Yeah. You stay there, yeah? Once he's sure it's safe, Tom tries something new. I thought, if I can get this back upright, we can drive out of here. I tied it to this little dumb tree, and I hooked that to the bumper, and I started ratching it. The vehicle was teetering a little, not very much, but a little. And I thought, gosh, if I can just get it to that point, it would fall, you know, come right back. Tom was exerting himself and trying very hard to get that vehicle to move. I tried to move it. It was wasted, futile, but I had to try it. I'm sorry, honey, I can't do it. Anything? No. Me neither. The Burrow Mountains all around them block out any mobile phone signal. There was a phone there with a slice through it. It was totally nothing. Did you tell your sister we were out here? No. I didn't tell her where we were going. I didn't tell anybody either. And nobody knows where we are. I guess not. Tom and Linda's fun day out just turned deadly serious. They didn't tell anyone where they were going. And in this remote spot, many kilometers from the highway, the chances of them encountering a passing hiker are vanishingly small. We were in a very remote place, no tracks of any human life around us. We were it. I said to Tom, we're not going to have enough water. Very profound statement. We don't have enough water. The two bottles of water Linda brought for lunch are nearly empty. I remember that fleeting thought that I had. It came back to haunt me. The temperature is in the 30s and rising. Tom and Linda know that if they stay put, they'll run out of water within hours. It was a real conundrum for me. I knew the rule. You should stay with the Jeep. In this heat, the 30-kilometer uphill hike back to the highway would be tough enough for youngsters, let alone a couple in their late 60s. Tom comes up with a plan. The Gila River was below us somewhere. I didn't know for sure where. If they hike downhill, they can cross the river and join the highway at a different point. Before they set off, Tom packs one last essential bit of kit. In the back of the vehicle, I had a pistol. It was a 357 Magnum. The main reason I carried that pistol was mountain lion. Also, there was brown bear around and I had two bricks of ammunition. An hour since they left the crash site, and the mid-afternoon temperatures are soaring towards a punishing 40 Celsius. The heat was intense. It's right in your face. You OK back there, Linda? Yeah, you? Fine, hon. And that took a lot of steam out of us. You get ahead of me now. Okay. The terrain becomes increasingly perilous. 
Keep going, honey. We turned and started down this trail. It was very narrow. And off to the left was a drop off. Tom! Tom! I'm okay. Oh, that's fine. As the brush thickens, Tom and Linda are all too aware of the risk of stepping on a rattlesnake. Let me see. The cut was deep and it was stinging and lots of blood was coming out. I got something for that. It's a nasty cut, but they can't let it slow them down. With the light fading first, they're desperate to reach the river before nightfall. Three hours later, they hear the sound they've been praying for. You could hear the river, and I felt that we were going to get out. This is not good. This is not what I expected at all. But instead of a crossing point to the highway, they face a raging torrent and unscalable cliffs. It's a dead end. The water was high, flowing fast. There's no way just to walk across it. It's a devastating blow. But after hours with barely any water, at least they can quench their desperate thirst. Water was paramount. But Linda, she didn't want me to fill the canteens with that water. She was very concerned about Giardia poisoning. Giardia is an intestinal parasite that lives in water contaminated by animal feces. In humans, it's treatable and hardly ever fatal. But Linda is adamant. I wasn't about to drink that nasty old water. I just said, oh, to hell with it. I drank it. But I wouldn't do it. That was the argument Tom and I had. We have to drink it, Linda. It's all we got. I'm not drinking it. Tom knows that the river water could spell the difference between life and death. That was very discouraging. I know she needed that water. But she was so afraid. As dusk falls, a more immediate danger confronts Tom and Linda. It's not looking good. At that point, we were a little scared because animals can smell that blood. Linda's cut leg makes them a target. Nocturnal predators like wolves and bears are starting to stir. I was very, very scared. There were footprints, but not human footprints. We knew that the animals must come to the space because it's easy access to the water. There are mountain lion around there. There are bear around there. If an animal sees that you're weak, a predator, it would attack. Tom's glad he brought his handgun, but he can't stand guard all night. I don't want to stay here, Tom. I wanted to get the heck out of there. All they can do is retrace their steps to the abandoned Jeep, the only shelter from predators. It means an arduous eight kilometer climb, a major test of endurance for the exhausted elderly couple. We really wanted to get back to that Jeep. 
More than four hours later, totally worn out, Tom and Linda finally make it back to the crash site. Let's get some rest. The overturned Jeep offers them protection, but little comfort. We were tired, but only one person could lay stretched out. Tom is beginning to face up to the enormity of their predicament. Escape is as far away as ever, and he knows he's put his 67-year-old wife into a life-threatening situation. I began to realize, I love this woman. You have to take care of her. I was very worried about her. Don't worry, Tom. Be fine. I started feeling guilty. I purchased the vehicle. I was the one behind it, and here we were out there in wilderness. Yeah. Go back to sleep, honey. By dawn, Tom has hatched a plan. There's only one option, a 30-kilometer uphill hike back to where they left the highway. For two people in their late 60s, it's a huge challenge. They must get going before it gets too hot. I was starting to get anxious to get going. You all right? Just wait here. Linda, we've got to go. Whatever it is, just leave it. I wrote a note. I wanted people to know that we were 67 and 68 years old, and we were out of food, we were out of water. Linda. I knew that we had to leave that note on that Jeep so that if some miracle happened, at least someone would get to know where we were. OK, we can go now. By late morning, the temperature is already up in the 30s. As we were walking, it was just thick, hot. It's just hotter than blazes. Tom and Linda are exhausted and desperately thirsty, making every step an enormous effort. When I ran out of water, the reality truly hit that this is a dangerous, dangerous time. Yeah. Have some fun. I was devastated because I was going to have to share some of Tom's Giardia water. Linda has so far refused to drink the river water Tom collected, fearing it contains parasites. I had a little sip to get my tongue wet and I spit the rest of it out. I said, Linda, don't waste that water. You're gonna need that water. I was very worried about her for that. As the temperature reaches nearly 40 Celsius, Tom and Linda are losing a staggering 10 liters of fluid a day. If they don't get water soon, they could die here. I looked up, and here's this huge, big uh, bird flying over us. Buzzards, Tom. And I thought, gosh, we got to get moving here. That was very scary. If we don't get out of here, if we don't get water, we're going to be there at dinner.
After four hours of hiking, Tom and Linda are utterly exhausted. Let's rest a while. I knew then that we were, you know, we're starting to fade a little bit. Their river water is agonizingly close to running out. Tom knows it's vital that Linda drinks what's left of the precious fluid. Tom is blaming himself for putting his wife in such a desperate situation. Linda was innocent. She was going for the ride. And um, I felt guilty about that. I'm so sorry, Linda. I'm so sorry, honey. If Tom and Linda don't find water soon, the outcome is brutally simple. No water meant death. I was starting to realize that I was weakening faster. Suddenly, amid the scrub, Tom sees something. There was this huge big prickly pear plant. And I said, Linda, you know what? We could eat some prickly pear here and maybe gain some liquid. We were excited to find the prickly pear cactus. This is great. Linda didn't consume all that much. But Tom cannot get enough of the prickly pear. I just ate the whole thing. It's a small but welcome injection of fluid. At first, we were elated. We were both joking about how good we felt. Both of us felt extremely energized. Wow, this is great. We're moving. We were really walking fast. But then I started feeling my stomach, and I said, Linda, I have to stop. I had major diarrhea. Tom. After the diarrhea bout, Tom did seem, if not broken, just withered. And I just felt so terrible for him. He apologized for being sick. He didn't have to. Uh, oh, I felt terrible for him. So sorry. It was the most ill I've ever seen, Tom. <laughs> Too exhausted and dehydrated to move, Tom has a desperate idea. I had just gone through that diarrhea bout, and I said, Linda, can you drink your urine? And I said, we got a plan on doing that, because we cannot lose liquid. It's a drastic measure, but one they hope might just keep them alive. The taste in your mouth is awful. 
But after a while, I found you just chug a lug. At that moment, I felt that it was one of the only things we could do to save ourselves. I didn't feel like an animal. I just felt like a desperate person. Tom and Linda know they should have hit the highway by now. If they've drifted off course, they could be heading even deeper into the wilderness. Tom, look up there. Look up on the ridge. Hey! Down here! There were two distinct colors up there, and I realized they were shirts of two different people. We need help! I remember yelling, help us, help us, we're dying. We need help! 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 We're dying! Bam, bam, bam. Help! God. And then nothing. It was very crushing because there is our lives right in front of us. We're saved if those two people would just do something, and they didn't. It's a devastating blow. Whoever they are, the passers-by have ignored an elderly couple in trouble. This callous act could have signed their death warrant. As they push on in search of the highway, severe dehydration is now playing tricks on Tom's mind. We were dehydrated. We were very dehydrated, and my mind was not near as sharp. We were starting to lose orientation. I could feel my logic is not as sharp and quick as it was. And I was definitely weakening. But Linda is even weaker. Sorry. We were so, so dehydrated by then. And the energy and strength level was fleeting. <laughs> Linda was so fatigued, she just collapsed. And I had to rest and lay down. That's it, Tom. I can't go any further today. I got to stop. OK, sweetie. As it's close to dusk, Tom decides all they can do is hunker down for a second night in the wilderness. We were so fatigued, we just wanted to sleep. Tom and Linda have survived another grueling night. But Tom is desperately worried about his wife. By late morning, as temperatures soar into the 30s, it's clear that Linda is in serious trouble. I could see she was really struggling. It took a lot of strength for her to keep going. She's had nothing to drink for more than 24 hours. I realized that Linda had lost her gait. And she was leaning on that stick more and more. 67-year-old Linda is paying a terrible price for refusing to drink the river water. 
I was feeling a terrific pain in my back. Every time I took a step, my back was just killing me. The pain is a terrifying sign that dehydration is causing Linda's kidneys to fail. If they shut down completely, she will die. Linda was starting to become weak. It was starting to get real scary. Then, Tom starts to recognize the terrain. Coming into Saddle Rock, we had passed a huge ranch. There's got to be a ranch around here somewhere. I could see on the map the hiking trail. I think you must. And I said, maybe we'll come out near that ranch. Tom decides to head downhill, praying it's the right direction. Finding the ranch could be Linda's last chance. Then, amid the dry, colorless scrub, Tom spots a flash of vivid green. <laughs> There's green grass. You could feel moisture. You could put your hand on the ground, and it was wet. Tom knows there has to be a water source nearby. Hey. I'm an engineer. I knew this was a wellhead, and there's got to be a way to get water here. Oh, please let there be water here. Hey. I thought this is it. We're going to have water. We're going to have water. Something had to be running somewhere. let us get to that water. This is crazy. The well is probably for watering livestock, but he can't find a way to the water. <laughs> it's an agonizing moment. Tom knows he's just meters away from water that would save Linda's life, but he just can't reach it. It was so close, but not there, and it was, it was very frustrating to me. It's 72 hours since Tom and Linda got stranded in the baking heat of the wilderness. There's no sign of the hoped-for ranch, and every step Linda takes is now pure agony. As her kidneys start to shut down, she's literally dying from dehydration. I could hear her behind me. And I would walk, and I'd have to turn. She'd be a good distance behind me. That stick was ch -ch -ch in the ground. That's when I knew we were in real trouble. The pain in my back was terrible. It was excruciating. I realized that she didn't have a lot left in her. He begged me to get up and keep walking, but I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it anymore. Let's just rest here a while. I can't do this, Tom. And I said, Linda, come on. We, we, we're going to make it. I'm slowing you down. I didn't like the sound of those words. I didn't want her to give up. Don't be silly, Linda. You can make it. And I said, I love you. We've had a wonderful marriage. It's been a great ride, but you have got to leave me. No, I... Try 
come. You gotta go on alone. And she kept encouraging me. She says, you gotta go. You've gotta find someone or water. Go, go, go. Two of us can't die. I love that woman. I didn't want to leave her. It was very emotional for me, very, very hard to leave. That was Linda. <laughs> I had to go. There was no choice. A few hours later, and with Linda far behind him, Tom pushes on. If he doesn't find help soon, he knows he may never see her alive again. I don't know how much further I went. But now Tom is in trouble too. dropped. I woke up, my face was straight into the sand. My nose was just buried in the sand. It was all over my face. Linda. Tom has slept the whole night, losing vital hours that could spell the difference between life and death for Linda. Oh, God. That really scared me. I just felt like I had to save her. So I kept moving. But I couldn't walk a straight line. I felt drunk like I staggered. I was losing it. After his four-day ordeal, the 68-year-old Vietnam vet's body is finally giving up, and he's now losing control of his mind. I've never experienced anything like that in Vietnam. Never, ever, ever. I felt very close to death. Thoughts started coming into my mind. Tom, this is your last day on Earth. And I began to realize this is it. And I dropped to my knees and I put my hands like this. And I prayed to God. God. I'm at the bottom of my life. Please help me. Please help me. And I know that you and Linda don't always see eye to eye, but please save her too. I just said it right out loud. And I heard a whop, whop, whop. <laughs> I 
and then it looked like they were going away from it. So I fired three shots in here. there was that young medic waving at me. It was a miracle. God had answered my prayer. I cannot describe the feeling that is that you're alive and they're going to save you. The search and rescue helicopter was called out by two hikers who found Linda's note pinned to the upturned Jeep. Tom directs the rescue team to where he left Linda, but he has no idea if she's still alive. Ten minutes later, they find her. And I look over, and there is Linda laying there. I looked at that medic, and he looked at me, and he did this. <laughs> he did this. <laughs> I'm sorry. Linda was alive. Hospital treatment saved Linda's life. But the ordeal left a serious legacy. Dehydration destroyed most of her intestine, and she now needs an intravenous drip to survive. This happened to me, and I've got to make the most of it because I've got a lot more life in me. I still, to this day, feel guilty. I have to work on that all the time. I love her so much. I will always take care of her. <laughs>